and we see that there's been a Syrian hacker group that has released diplomatic cables um, from 2012 when the video of in, uh, the innocence of Muslims was released and Obama had sent a diplomatic cable to Turkey. And in this diplomatic cable, we see here um, out of the BG News, bgnnews.com, Syrian hackers claim to have breached Turkish government accounts February 9th, 2015. And it says here that the hackers have released a total of 967 email accounts on 14 categories of the internet and availing scores of correspondence made between 2009 and November of 2012. Well, the this actual uh, Syrian electronic army um, releasing on their Twitter page the PDF format of these cables. And in this, we actually see that Barack Hussein Obama is pushing for the unity of what's going on in the Middle East through the Syrian, um, the Free Syrian Army, the, the, the moderate, quote unquote, moderate um, Islamists that they're backing with the arms, which are jihadists and their God is Allah. And this is actually fulfillment of prophecy when we look to prophecy. In Daniel 11.39, it talks about this. It says, Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God. This strange God is a strange God because in the time of Daniel, this God did not, did not exist. This is a God that is unknown to Daniel and the people of the time because Islam did not come until long after this prophecy had been given. So this is a strange God. This is Allah and his armies. And this is what they're doing with these strongholds. They're tearing down uh, fortresses. And this is through their jihadi armies that they are backing and funding. Well, interesting to note that in this prophecy, it talks about how the Antichrist um, will acknowledge this strange God and increase with glory. Well, in this diplomatic leak, we actually see a correspondence between Barack Hussein Obama and the Turkish Prime Minister, and when, when we read this, it's absolutely profound. Syrian hackers leak Obama's letter asking Erdogan for help. February 9th, 2015, Obama to Erdogan. He writes in the cable, quote, I believe that you are one of the most credible voices in the Islamic world today and that if people hear you calling for calm and condemning violence, it will have a real impact, end of quote, stated Obama in his letter to Erdogan, adding... Quote, it will be important to emphasize that diplomatic personnel and facilities must be respected and that the way to defend religion is through peace rather than violence. As people of faith, we have an obligation to prevent the people who did this video provoking a cycle of violence that violates the values that undergird our faith. End of quote. Obama writes in this cable to the prime minister of Turkey, who is a Muslim. He relates his own faith to that of the prime minister of Turkey, saying our faith, admitting and acknowledging that he is himself a Muslim, thus fulfilling the prophecy of he shall acknowledge and increase with glory the God of Islam, Allah. Look at a part of Barack Obama's life that most people probably have never known about. When Obama's stepfather changed jobs and moved the family to another neighborhood in Jakarta, Obama's mother enrolled him in the Bazuki Public School. This was Obama's first, former class. classmates showed me his old desk. Barry sat here, Barry Barack sat there, and then you sat there. The school's makeup reflects the population of Indonesia, more than 90% Muslim. There is a mosque in the school. It overlooks the playground. And every day at noon, the children are called to prayer. The only record of Obama having attended the school is this old register. And look, it lists his name as Barry Satoro. That's the name Obama took from his Indonesian stepfather, Lolo Satoro. That class register says Obama came from Honolulu and lists his date of birth. But look at his nationality. It's listed as Indonesian and his religion as Islam. As a boy, I spent several years in Indonesia and heard the call of the Azan at the break of dawn. As some of you know, my perspective has been shaped not only by my values as an American, but by my experiences as a child in Indonesia and visiting my father's family in Kenya. Assalamu alaikum. Many other Americans have Muslims in their families or have lived in a Muslim majority country. I know because I am one of them. I have known Islam on three continents before coming to the region where it was first revealed. 
That experience guides my conviction. You, you're absolutely right that John McCain has not uh, talked about my Muslim faith. My Muslim faith. My Muslim faith. As the Holy Quran tells us, the Holy Quran teaches that, the Holy Quran tells us, and the Holy Quran also says, we will convey our deep appreciation for the Islamic faith, which has done so much over the centuries to shape the world. I would like to speak directly to the people and leaders of the Islamic Republic of Iran, their great and celebrated culture. Over many centuries, your art, your music, literature, and innovation have made the world a better and more beautiful place. We know that you are a great civilization, and your accomplishments have earned the respect of the United States and the world. I also know civilization's debt to Islam. It was Islam at places like Uluzar that carried the light of learning through so many centuries, paving the way for Europe's renaissance and enlightenment. In ancient times and in our times, Muslim communities have been at the forefront of innovation and education. Islam is not part of the problem in combating violent extremism. It is an important part of promoting peace. The enduring faith of over a billion people is so much bigger than the narrow hatred of a few. And I consider it part of my responsibility as President of the United States to fight against negative stereotypes of Islam wherever they appear. We are no longer a Christian nation. We do not consider ourselves a Christian nation. Or the United States has been enriched by Muslim Americans. Since our founding, American Muslims have enriched the United States. Islam has always been a part of America's story. There is a mosque in every state in our union and over 1,200 mosques within our borders. You know, one of the points I want to make is, is that if you actually took the number of Muslims, Americans, uh, you know, we'd be one of the mo largest Muslim countries in the world. Let there be no doubt, Islam is a part of America. He did bow to the Muslim king while he did not do it to the British Queen of England. And by bowing, he showed the world that I am subservient. I do owe, uh, bow down to you as a Muslim king, something no other uh, president has done with Saudi Arabia. The Saudi king is his peer. He is not his subordinate in order to bow for him. And this is exactly what Obama did. Usually it is out of respect that someone would nod his head when bowing to royalty and the ladies will give curtsy. But Obama went beyond what is required as a head of state and bowed to the Saudi king, and that's unacceptable. Right, it sent the wrong symbol. What, when you say it's saying it sends the wrong signal, what signal do you think it sends? It sent a message that Islam is superior to any other master or king or president in the world. That an American president bound to a Muslim king. It also sent a message that terrorism and jihadism is giving Islam the respect it, it should have on the world stage to the point that it made an American president for the first time in history bow to a Muslim king. As you listen to the following interview of retired U.S. Army Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin conducted by WND Radio, please remember that the Obama administration and the Hillary Clinton State Department had a heavy hand in the initiating and continuance of the Arab Spring uprisings and vigorously defended it. What was the result of the Arab Spring? The undeniable empowerment of the Muslim Brotherhood, a radical Muslim terrorist organization that has as its main goals the destruction of Israel 
and the destruction of the United States from within by infiltration techniques. Please also remember that it was Barack Obama himself in his book Audacity of Hope on page 261 who said, quote, I will stand with the Muslims should the political winds shift in an ugly direction, end quote. Do you still believe there's a significant infiltration risk in our own government? Oh, listen, our government is so infiltrated, and the Muslim Brotherhood in America has so much influence in this country. It is incredible. If, if Americans only took the time to do the proper research and find out just how deep this infiltration into our government is, it would, it would just frighten you. I just gave a talk on this last weekend to some folks here in Washington, and they walked away saying, why don't we know this? And my answer is because it is not in the interest of the mainstream media's uh, agenda to tell you. Barack Obama, listed as a practicing Muslim and Indonesian citizen in school records, early in his presidency, reached out to his Muslim brothers in the Middle East. January 21st, 2009, the first head of state that Obama called as president was Palestinian PLO chairman Mahmoud Abbas. Abbas works alongside Hamas the Muslim Brotherhood terrorist organization whose charter calls for the annihilation of Israel. April of 2009, Obama secretly met with members of the Muslim Brotherhood in Washington, a group whose own documents call for the destruction of the United States and the creation of a worldwide caliphate. Throughout his presidency, Obama has met with Muslim Brotherhood front groups like the Council on American Islamic Relations, literally hundreds of times. The Obama administration is currently gorged with Muslim Brotherhood operatives hiding behind the mask of front groups masquerading as Muslim outreach groups. Back to our Muslim Brotherhood Commander-in-Chief, Barack Obama. On June 4, 2009, Obama gave his so-called Cairo speech in Egypt where he demanded the front row be reserved for Muslim Brotherhood members. To the consternation of then Egyptian President Hasni Mubarak, the Muslim Brotherhood at the time were outlawed in Egypt because of their extensive ties to terrorism. According to Middle East researcher Tony Cartolucci, beginning in December 2010 and early 2011, the U.S. State Department, collaborating with George Soros-funded human rights groups, orchestrated the so-called Arab Spring throughout the Middle East and North Africa, seeking to topple secular governments and replace them with Islamic dictators. On January 14, 2011, after massive rioting, the first leader deposed was Tunisian President Zain Alabin Ben Ali, who was quickly replaced with an Islamic dictator. April 2011, Yemeni President Ali Abdullah Seli, in the face of the Arab Spring protests, and was also replaced with an Islamic dictator. Libya took a little more work on Obama's part. Phony protests and stage riots were not enough. Obama engaged in an illegal war against Libya, spurning congressional approval that resulted in the toppling of Muammar Gaddafi on August 23, 2011. There arose no Islamic dictator, however, only anarchy in which Islamic gangs now roam the streets and murder with impunity. Barack Obama moved on to Egypt, no easy country to topple given that the Egyptian president, Hasni Mubarak, has been a steadfast ally of both the United States and Israel for decades. Barack Obama, being the master community organizer that he is, organized the toppling of Mubarak himself. Muslim Brotherhood operatives were dispatched to orchestrate the huge Tahrir Square protest that lasted for a staggering 18 days and numbered hundreds of thousands of people. According to Aaron Klein's book, Impeachable Offenses, on January 29, 2011, U.S. Envoy Frank Wisner secretly met with senior leader of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, Assam el Arian, to plot the toppling of Mubarak. During the Tahrir Square so-called protests, with the State Department, George Soros front groups, and the Muslim Brotherhood pulling the strings, per emails hacked from intelligence giant Stratfor, and released by Wikilinks, Barack Obama secretly phoned Turkish Prime Minister Recep Erdogan at least three times. The purpose of the phone calls was to discuss the toppling of Hosni Mubarak and his replacement. February 1st, 2011. 
Mubarak, bound to pressure from Obama, announced he would step down in seven months. To Obama, this was unacceptable. Obama informed Mubarak he needed to step down immediately. On February 11, 2011, Mubarak resigned and Obama got on his soapbox to declare to the world that history had been made. But the entire process was a sham. The people of Egypt have spoken. Their voices have been heard and Egypt will never be the same. By stepping down, President Mubarak responded to the Egyptian people's hunger for change. Obama's Islamic dictator, Muslim Brotherhood President Mohamed Morsi, was quickly raised up and immediately amended the Egyptian constitution to give himself dictatorial powers. He then purged the judiciary and military of judges and generals that weren't Islamists. Morsi then went about hunting down his enemies, going on a rampage of torture and murder, including openly crucifying Christians. Barack Hussein Obama, our Muslim Brotherhood Commander-in-Chief, all the while continued to support Morsi and sent him $1.3 billion in support of his Islamic dictatorship. But the Egyptian people quickly tired of Obama's Islamic brother-in-arms and threw him out, the first country to reject one of Obama's Islamic dictators. Turkey is now ground zero for supplying weapons to Obama's Syrian rebels, gorged with Al-Qaeda, ready to take power once al-Assad is taken out. Barack Obama and Erdogan dream of a return to the caliphate, stretching from Turkey to the Middle East and North Africa. This is President Obama's real legacy, the creation of the first jihadi state in modern history stretching from central Syria to central Iraq, this is shaping up to be the biggest Arab jihadi victory since the 12th century, 1187. Uh, the world is less violent than it has ever been. The truth? There has been a 60% increase in radical Islamist terrorism since you've been in office. And you just keep letting these guys out like the Bergdahl trade and the five terrorists. There have been reports that say ISIS was trained by U.S. instructors at a secret base in Jordan. Why are they so angry with us? Well, they want to reestablish the caliphate. They are operating with a goal, and that goal is to establish an Islamic caliphate worldwide. In their book, we are infidels and we need to be dominated. So their plan is not just for the Middle East. Their plan is for a worldwide caliphate, and they are consolidating sources across the world. All right, so this isn't a question of establishing. Sometimes we hear about the ark, uh, you know, from Syria and Western Iraq and, and that ark. We're talking about a caliphate all over the world, not just in the Middle East. Is that correct? Do both of you agree with that Eric absolutely uh, judge that's the ultimate goal is a worldwide global caliphate it sounds crazy to a lot of people listening but this is what they want this is what they want and they won't stop it starts in Iraq and Syria then it expands that's the ultimate goal global domination they make that clear let me speak as clearly and as plainly as I can America is not and never will be at war with Islam Thank you. And Ed Shomar Mubarak.